Hello, everybody. Welcome. It is my great honor to welcome you to the first exhibition at the Janet Turner Museum uh, for this year. And uh, my name is Daria Booth. I'm the Senior Director of Philanthropy here at Chico State. And I have had the wonderful honor of working in the College of Humanities and Fine Arts for several years and worked closely with the board and staff at the Turner Museum. And it has been a joy. Not only am I personally interested in fine art prints and the techniques, um, I have met some incredible people. And one of those people was Reed Applegate. He was one of my favorite people in all of Chico. And I can see there are many people here who knew him and knew him well. Um, people who knew him for almost his entire life. So I'll just be saying things that you already know, um, but I would like to start by uh, saying hello and welcome to Reed's cousin Richard Applegate, his wife Sandy, his nephews and grandnephew um, right in the back there. So thank you for being here. And for those of you who knew Reed, he was um, a man of many talents. He was very quirky. He was really interesting. He was caring. He was humble. He was a piano player. He was a collector. He was an art student. He was a philanthropist. He was a childhood friend that kept his friendships for his entire life. He was the guy that met with his friends at Upper Crust, I think every Tuesday morning for many, many years. I knew if I had to catch him, I could go over there and find him along with Mike Halderson and Larry Wall and Sal Asena. Um, But I also would try to catch him on campus, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating this, but it's just one of the things that charmed me about, about Reed um, in that he walked really, really fast. We all know he walked everywhere, all over town, and he walked super fast, and he had you know, his binder, with papers coming out of it, and he had his hair flowing back, and he kind of was like this, like, like always in the studio, and, and fast. And I remember trying to catch him at times, and I couldn't catch up. So I finally learned to come out of my building and knowing his schedule when he was coming from the library over to the Turner for his volunteer work, I could stand in the middle and wait for him to come and like stop him. He would show up at my office to talk about things um, and kind of hover near the doorway, afraid that he was bothering me. Um, he was just a delightful and wonderful man. And he was a collector, and he had this wonderful, wonderful collection that he was passionate about. And Rachel is going to tell you all about that. And he's also a philanthropist. I always refer to him as more of a budding philanthropist as he, he wanted to help, he, wanted, he, was, he cared about the art students. He was a former art student himself. And not long before he passed away, he established an endowed fund uh, for art students here at Chico State. And he was always, always very, very supportive and caring for all of the students and faculty here. And, um, and we miss him. We miss him so much. But, and I wish he was here to see his show because uh, he had it in his house and it's so different now. And I was thinking about how it's interesting, someone who collects privately in their home and then it comes into a museum and it's shown in a different way. And I think he would have been delighted, absolutely delighted with this. And so um, in my time here, uh, I've worked with some really wonderful people, Reed, the board of the Turner. And in the past year, with our wonderful curator, Dr. Rachel Skokowski, Rachel is amazing. That's all I can say. <laughs> I think many of you have met her and know her background, but I'll just share with you that uh, her degrees are from Princeton and then her doctorate and master's from Oxford. She's a Rhodes Scholar. Um, she is, is uh, researching 17th and 18th century prints and printmaking. Um, she has a sincere interest in making the museum accessible to all. And in this past year, if you've come to the exhibits, you've seen that in action. We had our first bilingual um, 
catalog. Uh, we have all kinds of things that make the Turner um, a museum for everybody. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Rachel Skokowski to the podium. Thank you so much for those kind words, Daria, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm so excited to kick off a new year at the Turner, my second year with this very special exhibition and celebration. But first, some thank yous are in order. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Machupta on whose traditional lands this event is taking place. Without their support and continued positive presence in our community, we would be unable to forward the cultural and educational work that is at the heart of this event. And as Daria um, already pointed out in the back, um, I really want to say um, thank you with immense gratitude to Richard and Sandy Applegate, um, who've worked tirelessly to make this donation and this exhibition happen. Um, and I can personally say that they have impressed us all with their strength and art handling skills. <laughs> And I'd also like to thank our Turner Collections Manager, Adria Davis, who designed the beautiful catalog um, that you can take a look at after this. Um, our designer, Anna Olson, who made this cover that I think really captures Reed's spirit. Um, and also one of our Turner board members, Caleb Klungfett at Art Etc. in town, um, who did the really stunning framing for the exhibition. And of course, thank you to the team at HFA um, who make these talks and our reception afterwards possible. So this evening is an opportunity to celebrate a beloved Chico figure and his generosity to the Turner, uh, but also, and maybe most importantly, to do that by spending time with two of his favorite things, Northern California art and printmaking. And unlike many of you here, I sadly never got the chance to meet Reed in person. He passed away just a week after I started as curator at the Turner last August. However, even if I didn't get a chance to meet him, I do feel like I've gotten the privilege to get to know him through his greatest passion, his art collection. So tonight I'm gonna to walk you through some of the highlights of the 47 works from Reed's personal collection that are now part of the Turner. I hope you'll leave here getting to know a bit more about Reed and a lot more about Northern California art and printmaking. And then I hope you'll all honor his memory by doing what he loved second best, which is eating free food at art openings. <laughs> so Reed Applegate was born and raised in Chico. He attended Chico High and Chico State, um, where he graduated in 1965. And his passion for collecting art uh, began while he was here with his first purchase of Aketa Kolvitz um, print in 1964. And this really grew into a lifelong love of Northern California art and of printmaking. Um, as Daria mentioned, he supported so many cultural institutions around Chico, the North State Symphony, the Chico Community Ballet, and of course he gave a portion of his collection as the founding collection um, at Monca. But he particularly loved the Turner. Uh, this photo shows Reed in front of um, one of the artworks from this exhibition, um, which he lent to a 2011 exhibition at the Turner um, called Six Degrees of Tebow, um, along with many of the artworks that are on view today. And as Daria mentioned, uh, Reed volunteered at the Turner for years, researching artist birth and death dates. Uh, if you've had a chance to look at our newly digitized online collection. You can thank him for some of that information. Uh, and he was honored with the Turner Prize in 2013 when this phenomenal lithographic codex by Enrique Chagoya was purchased in his name for the collection. And did you know that Reed was a printmaker himself? Uh, he also took printmaking classes from Janet Turner when he was a student at Chico State, and we do have one of his prints in the collection. So as a student, as an artist and as a collector, Reed was drawn to prints. What makes print collecting so special? And did you really think I wasn't going to fit some 19th century French prints in here? <laughs> um, although Reed collected works in different media, including paintings, drawings, and sculpture, he was a print collector at heart. And as you can see from these fabulous 19th century images, 
Print collecting has long exerted a special pull. Whether you're contemplating a print in the privacy of your own home, visiting print studios to collect artworks hot off the press, or sharing your favorite prints with your friends, collectors have been drawn, sometimes obsessively, to prints. But what makes print so special? And some of you might also be wondering, what exactly is a print? As a museum dedicated entirely to prints and printmaking, our goal at the Turner is to share precisely what, make, um, what makes prints unique as an art form. But it doesn't help my job when a quick Google uh, gives you definitions like these. So <laughs> instead, what I want to emphasize is that the prints that Reed collected and that we have in the Turner collection are all original prints. They aren't the kind of reproductive prints you can buy in a museum gift store or a digital printout of other artworks. They are original works of art created by an artist by hand with all the creativity and labor that you would expect from any other art form. So a much more helpful definition of a print might be an artwork made by transferring ink from a matrix, not that kind of matrix, a copper plate, a wood block, or maybe a lithographic stone, um, transferring the ink from this matrix onto paper to create a final image using a printing press. And of course, there are an infinite number of variations and exceptions to this process, but the key thing is that all of them involve artistic originality and creativity. And there's one further aspect of printmaking that I want to emphasize, because it helps explain what made Reed's collection and this um, exhibition so special. And this is what I like to call the paradox of printmaking. Every print, like this amazing etching of orange jello covering the San Francisco skyline, uh, is simultaneously a unique work of art and one of multiple copies. So the artist David Gilhooly could decide to print one, two, three, four, five, six, a hundred, a thousand copies or impressions of the same print. Um, this means that we could own one impression of the print in the Turner and another impression could be framed on your wall at home. And this incredible multiplicity of printmaking makes it a more democratic and accessible art form where the same image can exist in many places at the same time. However, one of the thrills of print collecting is that not all of these seemingly identical impressions of a print are created equal. And this is where the expertise and the interests of the collector comes into play. So some prints are sought after more than others, and Reed knew the difference. So here we have two uh, beautiful prints by Wayne Thiebaud and Peter Volkos, significant artists whose work we would already be thrilled to add to the collection. But what makes these pieces even more special can be found by looking a little more closely. So at the bottom of Volkos's print, we have the abbreviation AP, which stands for Artist Proof. And at the bottom of Thiebaud's print, you can read Trial Proof. And these notations mean that these are proof prints, or prints made early in the process when the artist is still testing their ideas. Prints like these can offer an exclusive peek into an artist's working process or an insight into their decision making. Plus, artists typically only make a few proof prints, making them even more rare and desirable. And finally, in the case of these two examples, both use a copper plate technique called dry point, which can wear down over time meaning that prints made earlier in the process have this rich, velvety quality um, that is lost in some of the later impressions. So by purchasing these proof prints, Reed truly got the best possible impressions of these two prints. And I know I've sped pretty quickly from print collecting 101 to advanced print collecting here, uh, but hopefully these examples give you a better sense of what makes print collecting uniquely challenging and exciting um, as well as an appreciation for the thought that went into making a collection like this. Uh, Reed not only chose to focus on a specific geographic area, Northern California art, um, but he also really um, singled out with care um, some special prints for these characteristics. And for the remainder of the talk, um, I'm going to highlight five additional aspects that make Reed's collection and this donation so exceptional. And the first is a sense of humor. Uh, historically, 
print collecting um, was often viewed as an exclusive pastime, limited to serious art connoisseurs. But if you've already been around the exhibition, uh, you'll know that many of the pieces in it prove that collectors and artists don't need to take themselves too seriously. Not only that, but fun and funky art is a significant part of Northern California art history. And there's no one funkier than Reed's favorite artist, David Gilhooley. Uh, he's known for his work in ceramics centered around frogs and food, like this tempting frog candy sampler um, or a deli sandwich, amphibian style. Uh, Gilhooley's work also embodies two important moments in Northern California art. The rise of the UC Davis Art Department as a creative powerhouse in the 1960s and 70s, and the funk art movement during the same period. Founded in 1959, the Davis Art Department hired professors like Wayne Thiebaud, Robert Arneson, Roy DeForest, Ruth Horsting, who taught the next generation of students um, like Kilhooley, um, Margaret Dodd, or Bruce Nauman. And the unorthodox teaching methods of this free-spirited new department um, really fed into what became known as funk art, works that irreverently mixed the high and low um, in absurd pieces that often pushed the boundaries of taste um, or what art could or should be. But of course, in keeping with the same anti-establishment spirit, uh, many artists resisted labeling their works in this way or even denied the existence of a fully-fledged movement. Uh, at a 1967 symposium in UC Berkeley, celebrating the seminal exhibition titled Funk, uh, panelists got into such a heated debate about this topic that a shoe was actually thrown across the stage at one point. <laughs> but I think we can all agree that Gil Hooley's ceramics and prints certainly embody the spirit of funk art in his creation of an entirely self-contained frog world populated by a recurring cast of characters whose hijinks poke fun at American consumerism and the pretensions of the art world. And the funky nature of Gilhooly's prints also extends beyond subject matter to include shape and format, showing the breadth of what printmaking can be as an art form. This is a 1981 artist book that he made in collaboration with the Philadelphia Fabric Workshop titled Covering the World with Frogs. It features screen prints with hilarious reenactments of famous moments from history, religion, and mythology, all depicted as frogs. Uh, we've got frog George Washington crossing the Delaware, frog Noah's Ark, frog Romulus and Remus, and uh, frog Adam from the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> And I think that Gilhooly's irreverent experimentation with art history and also with printmaking um, as an art form uh, reaches a peak in um, one of my favorite items from the exhibition, which is his grocery bag portfolio. And this portfolio, which he made at Hirsch Green Press in Oakland, features five etchings, a custom box, um, and my personal favorite, a frog chip ceramic cookie. And you can really see the evolution of theme and processes that recur throughout his work, even in the lining of the box. And I recommend looking closely at this in the gallery um, because it contains the same shredded dollar bills that can be found um, in the nearby lithograph, one reconstituted frog skin. And once you open the box, um, the five etchings within show, Gilhooly's, show that there is more to Gilhooly's work uh, than just art historical puns. Although there are some good ones. Uh, how about a race down the stairs between a Dali pizza and a slinky sandwich? Um, but on the right here, or the right for me, yes, the right up there, um, you can see his portrait um, of J. Edgar Hoover, the controversial former FBI director who used illegal surveillance and blackmailing to conduct secretive abuses of power. And here, Gilhuli's making a not so subtle comment on Hoover's possible fiery fate after his death in 1972. And one of the challenges of showing unusual formats um, like this portfolio or the artist book is that we often don't have the space to show all of the prints at one time. Um, however, next week, there will be a really special opportunity to view all of these prints and um, several more in our archive with Turner Intern and 
art history master's student, Katie Bradley, who's somewhere here. Oh, over there. Um, and that's going to be next Thursday at 5.30 p.m. So um, if you're intrigued by these prints, I highly recommend coming back to learn more. And after his taste uh, for funky prints, the second element of Reed's print collection that I want to highlight is his interest in works from important print studios. We've already seen how Gilhuli worked with the Philadelphia Fabric Workshop and Hirsch Green Press to realize this artist book and portfolio. Because printmaking requires highly specialized equipment and training, it's common for artists to work with a professional studio or press to execute their projects, and then in turn, these studios can elevate the prestige of a print. And no print studio has been more instrumental in Northern California than Crown Point Press in San Francisco. Crown Point was founded by Katham Brown in 1962 and has since worked with over 100 different artists over the past 60 years. And Crown Point is known for their work um, with intaglios, copper plate printing, um, and for bringing in artists who work in other media to experiment and learn how to make prints while they're there. Um, and this can sometimes result in fiery work, literally. Uh, this is a screenshot from a video on their YouTube channel, which I highly recommend watching, of composer and artist John Cage making his famous fire prints in 1986 when he lit newspapers on fire on the press bed and then ran them um, through the roller to extinguish the flames. And other artists have used more conventional methods. Um, here we have Wayne Tivo in another video uh, working on a copper plate. And many artists returned to Crown Point again and again. Um, Tivo was actually the first artist that Catherine Brown invited to Crown Point in 1964. And here he is in 2019, still going strong at age 99. So we'll return to Tivo in a minute, but um, I wanted to spend some time with this beautiful example of a print made at Crown Point Press. Um, this is Robert Bechtel's 20th Street Capri. And Bechtel was a San Francisco artist who's best known for his mind-bendingly illusionistic photorealist paintings, usually of empty cars or street scenes devoid of people. And Bechtel is one of the artists who returned to Crown Point over several decades where he's made prints ranging from soft ground etchings to woodcuts to photogravures. And in fact, this print shows that kind of unique experience that somewhere like Crown Point can offer. He actually began working on this print in 1993, but he wasn't happy with the proof, so he abandoned the project. But when he came back in 2003 to work on a different set of images, um, he decided that he wanted to revisit the plates he dropped one, he added two new ones, and then published this finished work. And the specific qualities of intaglio printmaking, where the copper plate can be manipulated in different ways, this print combines three very different techniques, um, add, I think, a depth and a texture to Bechtel's prints that really differ from this very slick surface in his paintings. He said that he was particularly interested in capturing the distinctive, misty quality of light in San Francisco, what he called a certain flatness. And I think this print achieves that flatness while also generating a subtle mood for the viewer that I think emerges the longer you spend looking at it. It's more than a simple snapshot of everyday life, especially when you understand how much work and time went into the image. Why did Bechtel decide that this was the image he was happy with? Um, rather than the earlier version. Why did he choose such a mundane street scene? And as viewers, what memories and attitudes do we bring to this artwork and project onto it, from loneliness to maybe nostalgia? And another Crown Point print that captures this kind of quintessential San Francisco street scene, but from a very different perspective, is Wayne Thiebaud's Diagonal Ridge. This is a sensitive rendition in dry point an etching of cityscapes that he's also explored in painting. If you're a frequent flyer like me, you might actually recognize this painting in the middle, which is hanging in one of the terminals at SFO. They have an amazing collection. Um, and when you think of Thibaut, you might think of his colorful rows of cake, his pie, candy, his really luscious paint handling. So what happens when you remove that and focus instead 
on black and white graphic line work. And this is precisely the type of experimentation that he sought out at Crown Point. As he said in a 1987 lecture, making a print is, quote, an orchestration between what you think you know and what you're surprised to learn. And of course, it wasn't all work and no play for him as a printmaker. Uh, this etching of eight dogs is an amazing study in pet personalities and just the joy of scribbling lines um, with an etching needle. And these two Tebow prints plus a third lithograph in the gallery um, are really important additions to our collection. Uh, they double our holdings of Tebow prints. Um, previously, we've had three um, prints from Janet Turner's original collection. Uh, so it's really wonderful to be able to build on this strength, um, thanks to Reed's gift. And another print studio that's represented in the exhibition is Magnolia Editions in Oakland, which has been open since 1981 and works on both print and tapestry editions. And uh, this monumental 12-color lithograph um, by Robert Arneson is over three and a half feet tall, was made by the artist in collaboration with the team at Magnolia. And here you can really start to see all these links forming across Northern California. Um, we have Arneson working with a studio in Oakland. Um, while he was a professor at UC Davis, colleagues with Wayne Tebow, teaching David Gilhooly, all these people were connected in so many ways. Um, and Arneson is really known as a prolific sculptor um, whose work from the 1970s onwards focused on self-portraiture endlessly contorting and distorting his own image to explore ideas about identity and the self. And so this print combines in one image this obsession with portraiture and his second obsession um, that emerged in the 1980s with the artist Jackson Pollock. Although the two artists never met, Pollock acquired a literally larger than life status for Arneson um, and he began exploring Pollock's art the artist struggles with alcoholism and his tragic death in multiple prints and ceramic works, um, like this one from LACMA. And in the print in our exhibition, uh, you can actually see at the top the image of an upside down car and the phrase, look out, Jack, um, that referenced Pollock's fatal car crash. And Arneson created his own version of Pollock's trademark splatter paint technique um, through lithography. And this image here is an earlier state of the same print with only seven out of the 12 colors. So you can really see the level of depth that's in the final image. As you can imagine, this process is um, extremely challenging and incredibly time consuming. So Arneson would have sought out a professional studio like Magnolia Editions where he could produce such complex work. And this print and Arneson's obsession with the tragic ending of Pollock's life um, also has a biographical element. At the time, he was grappling with anger and grief over a series of illnesses, um, including a diagnosis with cancer, and that would ultimately lead to his death at age 62. So this print really stands as an exploration of questions about what happens to an artist's legacy when their career is cut short. Arneson, Thibault, and Bechtel's work all set the stage for a third important element of Reed's collection which is his interest in artists who move between different artistic media. As we've seen, artists often turn to professional print studios and presses to explore the possibilities of printmaking. So why would an artist who is primarily a painter or a sculptor choose to work in print? I want to dive into the work of three artists in the exhibition who had very different relationships between printmaking and their other artistic identities. And the first artist is P Peter Volkos, whose striking artist proof we saw earlier. Volkos was the leading force behind the California clay movement in the 1950s and 60s, also known as the American Clay Revolution, which moved away from the restrictions of traditional pottery to explore experimental forms and techniques. He founded the ceramics department at the Otis Art Institute in LA and at UC Berkeley, where he taught until 1985. And throughout his career, he made relatively few prints. But what I love about this one is how immediately you can see the connection to his work in ceramics. You can imagine the artist grappling with the challenge of transforming his distinctive shape, 
shaped 3D works, like one of his famous stack pots here, into a flat two-dimensional print. Yet this print still captures the visceral feeling of his work in ceramics, where he would cut, tear, and gouge the clay. And here we have these scribbling, slashing lines of the dry point needle, which is incising into the copper plate, as well as the dimensionality that comes from the copper plate itself being pressed into the paper in the printing press. And I really suggest looking at this one in the gallery because you can see how that's left behind this tactile record in the form of a very deep plate mark and that visible border around the edge of the print. If Folkos was an occasional printmaker, Frank Lobdell was an artist who made prints throughout his lifetime as a complement to his work in painting and drawing, but would not have considered himself a printmaker in his own right. You can immediately see from these two images from 1965, one made as a lithograph and one as a painting, that he was working with the same iconography, shapes, colors, across both media, even though the look and feel of each image is ultimately different as it is translated through ink and paper versus oil on canvas. Bob Dell, who taught at Stanford for over 30 years, is an interesting figure who stands apart from many of the concerns that animated Northern California art in the second half of the 20th century. In the 1940s, he was one of the few artists on the West Coast working in the abstract expressionist style. As his work progressed, Lobdell created his own visual vocabulary of signs, using idiosyncratic shapes like this boomerang that are repeated throughout his work to express deeply personal and often inscrutable emotion and meaning. From Volkos to Lobdell, we arrive at the other end of the artistic spectrum with Nathan Oliveira a painter for whom printmaking was essential to his artistic process. Another longtime Stanford professor who founded the printmaking program at the university, Oliveira was drawn to print early on in his career and remained both fascinated and frustrated by it throughout his life. We have these two Miramar lithographs in the exhibition, which form part of a larger series of four. As you can immediately see from the painterly, gestural brushwork in these images, Printmaking was more than a complement to Oliveira's painting practice. It was also a source of creative synergy. Oliveira made his first print in 1949 when he was a student at the California College of Arts and Crafts. And then in the 1950s, he purchased a lithographic press and stones for only 50 bucks so he could print at home. At this time, there were no specialized print shops in the U.S. like the ones we've seen so far. Instead, Oliveira executed a series of lithographs in 1956 and 57 that helped him win a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship to travel to Europe so he could work with Picasso's printer Merlot. Unfortunately for Oliveira, he made it all the way to France, but didn't make arrangements with Merlot in advance and was turned away. Students, never forget to do your homework. Even after the founding of American studios like Tamarind Lithograph, lithography workshop in 1960, to which Oliveira received a fellowship in 1963, he still preferred to print his own work. In contrast to many of the artists we've seen so far, he was frustrated by the typical division between artist and printer, and ultimately turned to monotype later in life as a means of bringing together painting and printmaking and completing the printing process by himself. A key element in Oliveira's work in both paint and print is the figure. Oliveira was part of the second generation of the Bay Area figurative artists, following in the footsteps of artists such as David Park, Richard Diebenkorn, or Elmer Bischoff, who turned to figuration in the 1950s when abstract expressionism and the New York School dominated the art world. It's easy to form an opposition between East and West Coast, abstract and figurative art, but the reality is that most Northern California artists exploring figuration, including Oliveira, combined aspects of the brushwork and methodology of abstract expressionism with new approaches to depicting the human body. Oliveira also looked outside the U.S. to the psychologically charged figurative work of European artists Max Beckman, Alberto Giacometti, and Francis Bacon. Oliveira's innovative approach to figuration is most boldly on display in this exhibition in the portfolio 12 Intimate Fantasies a series of lithographs that explore his own private dreamscape through wildly varying approaches to composition and mark-making. 
print series like this, The Four Miramar Prints, or a famous series on Edgar Allan Poe, allowed Oliveira to work through ideas across multiple images, testing and refining his approach. By this point, we've covered a lot of ground, from Davis to San Francisco to Palo Alto, so let's bring things back home to Chico. Thus far, we've looked primarily at 20th century works, so I wanted to highlight two contemporary artists in the exhibition who speak to Reed's desire to support living artists. The first is Jenny Robinson, and I'm cheating a little bit here because Jenny is originally from the UK and currently lives in Sydney, but she was an artist in, resident at, in residence at Kala Art Institute in Berkeley for over 10 years and has visited Chico four times as a visiting artist. We were lucky to already have one piece by her in the collection, so it's fantastic to be able to show these two together. Both prints come from a series of works on urban infrastructure, where the monumental scale of her subject matter, massive billboards, giant abandoned metal structures, is at odds with the fragility of the delicate paper and the intricacy of her line work. These are pieces that are immediately impressive and eye-catching, but that also reward closer looking as you spend more time with them. Alongside Jenny Robinson, I have to mention the fabulous work of Kathy Aoki. A professor at Santa Clara University, Aoki had a solo exhibition at the Turner in 2015. She is known for her work such as the Museum of Historical Makeovers, where she critiques pop culture and gender norms through humorous remakes of historical artwork. In the print on the right, we have a 19th century ballroom with a DJ booth and twerking on the dance floor. And since early 2000s, fashion is now apparently back in style. I'd like to bring back Aoki's faux encyclopedia instructions for a lower back tattoo or how to construct a juicy brand handbag out of a My Little Pony doll. And of course, art history buffs will recognize a nod to none other than Toulouse-Lautrec's famous painting of the viral dance craze of the 19th century, the Can-Can, reimagined with K-pop star Psy's viral 2012 dance Gangnam Style. With artists like Robinson and Aoki, it's also special to see how the Turner has acted as a hub for attracting contemporary artists working in print to Chico, a legacy I hope to carry forward as curator. And now I want to conclude by thinking about the final guiding thread throughout the collection, Northern California, a place where all the artists we have seen so far chose to live, work, and even represent in their art. I think for anyone who grew up in Northern California, including me, Waif Mullen's image of oak trees summons up an immediate sense of place, that quintessential Northern California landscape that means home for so many people. Other artists in the exhibition reflected on the idea of home more explicitly in their work. From 1966 to 67, Robert Arneson made a series of sculptures, paintings, drawings, and this print depicting his classic California ranch-style house on Alice Street in Davis. At the end of the year, he moved all of the furniture out of his living room onto the street and turned his house into an exhibition gallery. These pieces allowed Arneson to grapple with the limitations of his move from Oakland to a tiny town in the middle of fields to a newly formed art department at a university known for agriculture. Yet both the artist and his house still have big dreams. My favorite detail is the thought bubble at the top, where his house dreams of becoming a castle at some point. For many of us here tonight, Chico itself is our home, whether for four years as a student or for a lifetime. Reed valued the strength of the local art community here. He collected work from former Chico State students, like MFA student Jennifer Tancredo, whose own legacy lives on through the prize that is awarded in her memory at the annual student show. Reed also collected works by former Chico State faculty members, including David Hoppe and Vernon Patrick. Since Reed took his class with Janet Turner in the 1960s, the Chico State printmaking program has continued to thrive, and the Turner is proud to be a place where students regularly come to get inspiration. Finally, I want to end this presentation with this landscape by Sacramento artist Gregory Condos. It's a familiar view to any of us who've spent time driving along the river near here and a beautiful meditation on color and gesture. It also makes me return to the idea of the horizon. I wanted to call this exhibition Northern California Horizons 
because it captures the way that for much of the 20th century, and I would argue even today, Northern California was often viewed as a mere dot on a distant horizon from the perspective of the East Coast dominated art world. Yet as we have seen from the multitude of artists, styles, and movements represented in this exhibition, Northern California has a powerful artistic perspective of its own. The idea of the horizon also captures the way Reed looked to the future as a collector, purchasing prints with taste and care, learning about new artists, and expanding his collection over more than five decades. Finally, now that these prints have entered the Turner Collection, I hope they continue to inspire our students and visitors to look beyond their immediate horizons, to chase down new perspectives, or to appreciate a familiar view with fresh eyes. And like Reed, we hope you'll come back to see, revisit, and live with these prints for many more years to come. Thank you. Thank you.